So the guiding question behind the work I've been doing this year as a Newkirk Fellow is this. Uh, how do we promote socially diverse collaborations in communities of scientists? So uh, why have a question like this in mind at all? From a social engineering perspective, there are good reasons to want more socially diverse collaborations in scientific communities. So uh, there is evidence from the history of science, arguments and philosophy of science that uh, point to the fact that socially diverse collaborations are synergistic and often more conducive to the aims and goals of scientific inquiry than our socially homogenous collaborations. Uh, there's also some evidence to suggest that groups of socially diverse reasoners reason better than groups of socially uh, homogenous reasoners, uh, perhaps because of increased scrutiny of what would otherwise be shared, unspoken, common assumptions. Uh, and additionally, there's some uh, I think obvious social values to promoting uh, increased camaraderie across social identity group lines in scientific communities as a microcosm of society at large. Uh, so from a social engineering perspective, we want socially diverse collaborations, but of course we aren't social engineers. We can't just reach into scientific communities and make there be more socially diverse collaborations. Scientific communities are uh, complex, organically evolving systems comprised of scientists, each of whom have their own individual uh, choice-making capabilities and interests and desires and so on. But what we can do is we can entertain uh, what sorts of policies we can craft that would incentivize those scientists who comprise the community to change their actions in, in such a way that the consequence is what we ultimately want, namely the production of more socially diverse collaboration. Uh, and this is where the modeling approach that I employ and that I've been working on uh, really comes into play. Because, precisely because scientific communities are these complex evolving systems, it's often difficult to uh, get the policies right such that their consequences are indeed what we might hope their consequences should be. So I can be more uh, concrete. One question that I've spent a lot of time on this year, uh, in fact the main question uh, that I've taken on as a Newkirk Fellow, is asking the question, when is it sufficient to focus on policies that would uh, increase representation of historically underrepresented groups in science? Uh, so you might reasonably think, well, if we want socially diverse collaborations, look, I'm telling you that there are some benefits to these socially diverse collaborations. Well, I happen to know that uh, there's a number of problems of underrepresentation of the various social identity groups that I want to feature prominently in these collaborations. So maybe let's just focus on the uh, problem of underrepresentation, and if we fix that, we will get socially diverse collaborations as well. Uh, so how does one answer a question of the form, when is it sufficient to focus on just one policy rather than introducing more policies on top of that. So here's a tentative uh, impressionistic answer. It's sufficient when the uh, community of scientists looks one way when we go and inspect the community and collect data about the communication habits and the research uh, choices made by the scientists. When it looks one way rather than another way. This is where uh, my base model, I'll call it, is crafted to tell us precisely what way uh, would mean that it's sufficient to focus on the problem of underrepresentation and what way the community would look such that it's not sufficient. Uh, in particular, there are going to be cases where in certain particular communities of scientists, uh, even given perhaps problems of underrepresentation currently, there's already indication as teased out by my theoretical model, there's already indication that were we to fix the problem of underrepresentation, what we would then see is individual scientists um, clustering according to in-grouping, according to social identity, perhaps into subfields, rather than um, more generally integrating and promoting these socially diverse collaborations that we want. So in that sort of context, I want to flag another question that 
uh, my model is very well suited to do. In fact, I spent a lot of time, particularly in the early winter months, hammering out precisely what this would look like within the theoretical model. Namely, can socially diverse conferences and workshops and so on effectively promote those diverse collaborations in the cases where it wasn't sufficient merely to focus on the problem of underrepresentation? So above and beyond making sure that the scientific community as a whole is socially diverse, uh, do conferences uh, in which these different uh, members of the community are brought together, will they promote socially diverse collaborations fighting against the tendency towards the different social identity groups to just cluster amongst those with whom they co-identify? Uh, so in the context of my model, to be uh, slightly clear, this comes up as an intervention on the base model. So the base model is going to presuppose that we have a certain amount of representation of various social identity groups. And it's going to say, if we uh, take a small sample of those uh, scientists and put them in a conference, do we expect, as an empirical hypothesis, that this will uh, bring about socially diverse collaborations down the road? So I'll stop it here and turn it over to questions. I just wanted to thank the Newkirk Center for their generous support. Uh, this isn't my main research focus in my dissertation. So it was the funding that the Newkirk Center provided that uh, let me focus on this question of increasing socially diverse collaborations. So thanks. Question. On this uh, underrepresentation, does that kind of get back to the same problem we had with uh, teaching uh, fifth graders, and there's a big shift from girls being interested from the fifth and sixth grades or effects like that causing the underrepresentation, do you think? Uh, so I can speculate on that, in which my answer would be yes. My uh, source of evidence behind that speculation is maybe different from some of the other uh, sorts of evidence that, have, that came up in the earlier presentation. So there are plenty of cases in the history of science, which is what I've more focused on, uh, in which there are obvious pressures uh, and against individuals uh, in underrepresented groups when they try to get into the scientific spaces, they're pushed out. Uh, so there's a nice case, well, nice. There's a, in some sense, tragic case. Uh, but clear for demonstrative purposes. Uh, in the early history of uh, experimental psychology, before experimental psychology was the established means by which we could study um, early child cognitive development, I mean, there was also this movement spearheaded by Darwin and others uh, taking a more natural history type mentality where we're going to observe the child in the wild of the playpen, as it were. Um, and there's direct evidence to suggest that as the field came to be associated with women who previously weren't well represented in science, the method was increasingly scrutinized as not scientific and experimental psychology, which required labs that were controlled by men, uh, increasingly became the preferred scientific method. So that's an example where the underrepresentation problem perpetuates itself. Uh, in an alternative world in which there wasn't the problem of underrepresentation in advance, it's not at all obvious uh, where the pressures in favor of empirical uh, experimental psychology would have come from. That's why I'm inclined to think, yes, these absolutely are related. And moreover, it's not a matter of initial conditions that have caused the problems, but that there's evidence to say it's self-perpetuating. Would you agree that there's a certain, there are certain criteria that a person has to meet in order to become a scientist? Obviously, an education and background. The topic, do you agree with that? Probably. Okay, so um, where do you draw the line between uh, the background that is required to become a scientist and traits that would be valuable in terms of diversity? I didn't hear the last um, Where do you draw the line between? that are necessary to be a scientist and traits that 
traits that would be valuable in terms of diversity. Because it might be that they conflict with each other. You see what I mean? Uh, well, so I'm not sure, sure that they would conflict with each other. I will say that uh, a starting point from the work that I do is that we're taking it for granted that these uh, scientists are only differing in terms of certain uh, points of view that are somehow outside of what would be the minimum desiderata to be scientists. So in some respects, I'm taking for granted that there is a distinction there. There might not be a distinction that I think works out for an even stronger argument in favor of the diversity. Uh, in particular, we don't know in advance what those desidera desiderata are that would make a good scientist for a particular sort of research project. So from ignorance, the, the more ignorant we are about that, the more we're going to expect there to be virtues in increasing social diversity. Thanks.